Well, hey, folks, the prosecution says that Corey Richens was planning to flee the area as the police dragnet tightened up on her just before her arrest for killing her husband. Let's look at why I think they're barking up the wrong tree with the bug out bags. Hey, well, welcome to Profiling Evil in this episode on the Corey Richens murder trial. I've been watching the bell hearing today uh, on accused killer Corey Richens alongside Court TV's Ted Rollins. And I'm wondering what you're thinking about this case of a woman who's accused of poisoning her husband with five times the lethal limit of fentanyl. Now... Let's talk about what's hitting the mark in the case and where I think they're missing the ball. Make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button and ring the bell. But now let's dig into this case. This bail hearing is looking more like a preliminary hearing than a bail hearing to me. And the state of Utah came out swinging with what looked like a view into the evidence they have and why they think releasing this defendant on her own recognizance until trial is a mistake. Now, home run number one, in my opinion, was the corroborating effort they're putting forth on the circumstantial evidence. They brought in evidence that showed that Corey Richens, in their opinion, was purchasing illicit drugs from a drug dealer. Now, the defense is arguing that that drug dealer is only making all this stuff up because she wants a better deal for herself. That, that uh, all of it is a bunch of nothing. Well, here's the thing that I thought was so important about what happened today. The state introduced a number of different participants in these transactions, distancing the drug dealer as the sole witness in the transaction. Bottom line is I think they were successful in getting multiple potential witnesses to this illegal drug purchase, the drug that killed this man, and at the same time that it was happening in front of the judge. Now, they were also successful in getting comments that Eric Richens didn't abuse drugs. They actually cited how uh, many people, when they go to a special hunting place that he goes out of the country, will look for drugs to take while they're there. But Richens was always focused on the hunt and that he didn't seem to be seeking drugs. I think there's going to be other testimony to support that. Now, did he use some from time to time? I think it'll probably come out that, that there was uh, evidence to suggest maybe that's true. I don't know. But I like the fact that the state also brought in cellular data that showed that the phone calls were being made between the defendant, Corey Richens, and this drug dealer, highlighting the fact that uh, there were texts that were also there, but those texts had been deleted by not only the drug dealer, but by Richens herself. But they were able to prove that there was conversation going on, further corroborating that uh, drug dealer's testimony that they were putting together a deal. Bottom line, I think the state hit a couple of home runs, but I wasn't impressed at all with the inference that Richens was preparing to flee the area again a year later using those bug out bags as their evidence. I spoke with Ted Rollins on Court TV today about that. And I thought we'd just play that little clip here. That I think is going to be the real key in the thing they're trying to get across here. There's a couple of things that I really like. Number one, that they are showing multiple different sources corroborating that this transaction was occurring. So I think that's going to be really important. And the fact that Corey was the one initiating that and there were face-to-face -face transactions because i know the defense is going to say hey it's a dope dealer that's trying to get a better deal for themselves but that's really great when they're bringing in that corroborative kind of information the timelines i think when they get to the point of talking about the life insurance policies all that's going to weigh really heavily but i'll tell you this bug out bag thing doesn't uh, impress me at all Head. I mean, uh, a lot of people put these 72-hour kits or these kits together in case they ever had to leave their home, a, a, a flood or a, a gas problem or, or snow collapsing a roof because they live up in, in Camas, which gets a ton of snow. So having kits for the family 
to jump and grab and run and get away uh, quickly and still have all the things, important papers. To me, that doesn't really impress me. And I, I can see what they're trying to do there, but uh, a lot of people do that. And there's one pack for the husband. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it seems like that might be going nowhere. We'll uh, see. All right, well, let's get a break in here, and we'll get you back into the courtroom now for the cross-examination of this first of three witnesses for this bond hearing for Corey Richens. Stay with us. Well, what are your thoughts on this case, folks? Do you think the prosecution's going to convince the judge to keep Corey Richens in jail, at least until her trial, or will the judge release her? And what are your thoughts about those bug-out bags? Was she planning to leave <laughs> again a year later? Or is the prosecution making a whole bunch of ado about nothing? I hope you're going to put your comments down below. And folks, be kind to each other as you weigh in on these things. Hey, and make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button so that you don't miss any of our episodes as we release them. And please consider joining our channel memberships. Now listen, your donation really helps out, so please consider it. You can donate on PayPal as well if you don't want to do it through YouTube. So check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, here on YouTube. And remember that you can find Profiling Evil podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. Hey, thanks again, and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.